I told you that the Lord gave me a revelation about something the other day, and I was stunned. And you're going to have the chills when you hear it. It has to do with the parable of the trees. And I have to share this with you because I realize that once this thing is being seen by us, we know that the kingdom of God is at hand. You know the parable of the fig tree. You know it well. Probably almost have it memorized. And this was Jesus' parable. Now remember, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And he is a king that sits eternally on the throne of Judah, of the Davidic dynasty. Let me read to you from Luke 21, verse 29. And this is Jesus, the Messiah speaking, the king speaking. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Do you realize that I was just telling you that I believed that this terminology, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled? It's not just talking about, you know, a generation that just sees these things. But I believe it's the generation, King Charles III, born... November 14th, 1948, Israel born six months earlier, May 14th, 1948. The king's generation, the one who will sit on Israel's throne, his mother had to rule for 70 years before he could become king and sit upon that throne of David, the one that's going to be anointed on the stone of Schoon, Jacob's pillow stone, Jacob's pillar that was anointed, and then all the kings of Scotland were anointed upon it, and kings of High Ireland, I suppose, and then Edward I confiscated the stone, took it to England, where all of the British monarchs were coronated sitting upon the stone. And Edward built the throne chair that King Charles III will sit upon with the stone under it. Okay, so you know those things. So it's that generation, that king had to grow up. His mother had to rule for 70 years, and then he is going to sit upon the throne, and Israel is going to accept him as the anointed one, because he will be at his coronation ceremony. And they've been planning this whole scheme of putting one man as, you know, basically the king of the world. And probably that's why they put that phrase in the Titanic movie. You know, um, they know what they're doing. They're plotting. Okay, so that's the generation that shall not pass away. The one where the king that's going to grow up and then sit on that throne, the restored Davidic monarchy of an earthly king, the last one that will rule, that's a military man. King Charles III is, you know, the head of the armed forces. And I want you to remember that the English Royal Navy was considered the top military um, navy of the world. And they would make the ships out of none other than royal English oak trees. So the military ships represent him as a military man, 
what Israel was looking for was a military person and somebody who's just a basic man, you know, that's going to sit on that throne and be their Messiah, their anointed one. Okay, so we know that he's bringing the Jews and the Muslims and all these religions together and all of he's friends with all of the rabbis there and he's got the ancestors, his grandmother and um, I think it was an aunt, Ella. They are both buried on the Mount of Olives. They're considered righteous Gentiles and for this reason Israel accepts them uh, and he just falls right into place. So I'm thinking that it is referring to his generation is the one that will not pass away until all of this is fulfilled. The last earthly king sitting upon that throne. But now, what does the rest of this parable mean? Behold the fig tree and all the trees. So I've been talking about in the last two videos that I wanted you to remember that the Royal English Oak Tree that they built the Navy ships, the military ships for those in England with the Royal Navy, the Royal English Oak Tree is an oak tree that's very biblical. So I want to read Judges 9. And I'm going to start a little bit earlier than where I want to get to. But I'm going to start right at the top here. Judges 9, verse 1. Now Abimelech, son of Jerubbaal, went to his mother's brothers at Shechem and said to them, and to call all the clan of his mother, Please ask all the leaders of Shechem, Is it better for you that seventy men, all the sons of Zerubbabel, rule over you, or just one man? Remember that I am your own flesh and blood. And when his mother's brother spoke all these words about him in the presence of all the leaders of Shechem, their hearts were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. So they gave him seventy shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Barith, and which Abimelech hired some worthless and reckless men to follow him. He went to his father's house in Ophrah, and on one stone murdered his seventy brothers, the sons of Jerubal, and Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, survived because he hid himself. Then all the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the oak at the pillar in Shechem and proceeded to make Abimelech their king. So you've got King Charles III, he'll be standing next to Jacob's pillar, which is Jacob's pillow stone from Bethel, and the poles of the screen are made out of a wind-blown oak, a royal English oak, and these poles have the eagles at the top. So here you have the one who was going to be made king gathered beside the oak at the pillar and this pillar may very well be the same one for all we know so they were proceeding to make Abimelech their king so then we have Jotham's parable okay listen to this when this was reported to Jotham he climbed to the top of Mount Gerizim raised his voice and cried out First, I want to say, you have to remember that at Mount Gerizim, this is the mountain where they tried to make like a replica temple, like one that was in Jerusalem. So, this says, Listen to me, O leaders of Shechem, and may God listen to you. Oh, this just gives me the chills, you guys. The Lord is revealing this right now. One day, the trees set out to anoint a king for themselves. 
They said to the olive tree, Rain over us. But the olive tree replied, Should I stop giving my oil that honors both God and man to hold sway over the trees? What is that olive tree representing but the olive oil that was taken from the olive groves in Jerusalem to anoint King Charles the Third king? That's the olive tree and the oil from it. Okay, carrying on. Then the tree said to the fig tree, Come and reign over us. But the fig tree replied, Should I stop giving my sweetness and my good fruit to hold sway over the trees? Remember that King Jesus caused the fig tree to wither because it had no fruit. It was only bearing leaves. Okay, so the time for the true king to sit upon the throne had not yet come because King Jesus first was going to die, be buried, and resurrected the third day. And I'll tell you a little secret from my book. The fig tree is the fig tree of knowledge of good and evil. So they had already eaten the fig fruit in the garden and that's why there was no fruit on that tree. So King Jesus is revealing he's the king because the earthly monarchy of Israel and Judah had the sword brought against it with the deadly wound by a sword in the head, which the king is the head of state. And yet it's going to be revived and live and a new king is going to sit on that throne and be a, the anointed one. But Jesus is showing that that monarchy that used to exist was bearing no fruit. And so he caused it to wither because he is the true king. Okay, now we get to verse 13. But the grapevine replied, should I stop giving my wine that cheers both God and man to hold sway over the trees? What's the grapevine? The grapevine is the representative, the wine in the third cup of redemption at the Passover Seder that Jesus made in his blood to pay the bride's price to basically buy us back to himself, to God, so we could re-enter the Garden of Eden in the future, and he was making the way back to the Garden. Okay, so verse 14, Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, Come and reign over us. But the thorn bush replied, if you really are anointing me as king over you, come and find refuge in my shade. But if not, may fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Okay, what is the thorn bush? There is a tree that's considered one of the holy trees as is the Royal English Oak Tree. It's considered a sacred tree. The Holly Tree is considered a sacred tree. And it's called a thorn bush because the Holly leaves are sharp. And the Holly Tree became known as Christ Thorn. It represented Christ's thorns and thistles that he bore to take us back beyond, um, you know, death by reversing the curse of the thorns and thistles that came from the curse of Eden that brought forth death. So the thorn bush, it's said in Glastonbury that Joseph of Arimathea went across the Mediterranean Sea and he landed there in Glastonbury and he stuck a staff in the ground and this was a thorn bush 
So it's a Christ thorn. Okay? So when I said this, I, I will repeat. Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, Come and reign over us. That's Christ. That's the Messiah. But the thorn bush replied, If you really are anointing me as king over you, come and find refuge in my shade. But if not, may fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Okay, so where were the cedars of Lebanon? They were brought from Lebanon from the forest of the king that's now a protected forest. And they used the cedars of Lebanon to build the temple of the Lord. Solomon brought this wood by hiring Hiram of Tyre. And they brought this wood, floated it down by ship into the port of Joppa. And... They brought the cedars of Lebanon to build not only the temple, but also, I believe, um, the Sanhedrin building. Okay? So, this tells you in Judges 9 who the real king is. Isn't it interesting that the queen, she reigned for 70 years and this is talking about 70 sons. Um, and you have made Ambimelech the son of his maidservant, king over the leaders of Shechem, because he is your brother. If you have acted faithfully and honestly toward Jerubel and his house this day, then may you rejoice in Abimelech and he in you. But if not, may fire come from Abimelech and consume the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. So this parable in Judges 9 is telling you that one day the trees set out to anoint a king for themselves. And then they go on to list the things that represent the Messiah, the anointing of the olive oil, which King Charles III will be coronated with that Jerusalem olive oil, the fig tree of the Garden of Eden, and the fact that the kings, the people were either good figs or they were bad figs and the bad figs were very very bad so the fig tree withered the grapevine represents the blood of the covenant of the messiah and we need to take shelter and shade under the thorn bush which is christ who bore the thorns and thistles to take us back to the garden of eden so what am i telling you that the parable of the fig tree and all the trees are telling you that they're going to coronate a king for themselves because they have not accepted Christ, the true king of kings and lord of lords, the Christ thorn, the anointed king with the olive oil. One of the judgments that happened in Egypt when the Hebrews fled, one of the things performed by Moses and Aaron with the rod was that he smote their vines and also their fig trees and break the trees of their coasts. So what do we have in Mark 13? We have the temple's destruction foretold. Then we have the witnessing to all nations of the gospel. Then the abomination of desolation. Then the return of the Son of Man at the time of the lesson of the fig tree. That's because the trees are representing a king is about to sit on that throne. And Jesus' second coming, he's going to be that king. The king of kings and lord of lords. We see this in Isaiah 34, 4, where it says, All the stars in the sky will be dissolved, 
and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. This is God's judgment on the nations in Isaiah 34. Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, and he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia and upon the people of my curse to judgment. You know, Herod was an Edomian. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with the fatness and with the blood of the lambs and goats and the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. And the unicorns, something that's on King Charles III's heraldry, shall come down with them, and the bullocks and the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched day or night. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and the Bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion, the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles, in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons, and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, and screech owl also shall rest there, and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest, and lay and hatch, and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord, and read, No one of these things shall fail. None shall want her male, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever, from generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Micah 4, four it says, Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree when the Messiah comes. And no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. So, this is something when the Messiah comes. And Nathaniel recognized this when Jesus told him he saw him sitting under the vine and the fig tree. And he said, Lord, you are the Messiah. He knew he was king when he told him that. He had seen in the future that he was the king that was going to come and behold the fig tree and all the trees it means a king is going to be placed and coronated upon that throne this time it's going to be king charles the third but the real king of kings is king jesus the messiah of israel the eternal davidic dynasty the tribe of Judah will reign forever. 
Now listen to this. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, every one under their own vine and under their own fig tree. That's because they had a king ruling over them. And the trees with the vine and the fig tree and all the trees are proclaiming that they are about to enthrone a king. And when you see this happening, the kingdom of God is near, and it's this generation, that king's generation, that shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. Let's look at the parable of the fig tree in Luke 21, starting in verse 29. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree, and all the trees, when they now shoot forth and Ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. And when is this king being coronated upon the throne? As we're going from spring and summer is now nigh at hand. That king is going to be enthroned. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, what things? The restored Davidic dynasty, the king being set on a throne. The trees declare this. They came to say, you're setting me as a king upon the throne. When you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. That means the kingdom of God is nigh at hand because this is happening. Verily I say unto you, this generation, the king's generation, shall not pass away till all be fulfilled, till he's on that throne, till the last seven years' time of Jacob's trouble comes to pass. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now listen, we're to be watchful. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Why is that? Because they're choosing a king that's going to rule over the whole world under a one world government and a one world religion, and he's going to sit on that throne of David and Jerusalem and the whole Sanhedrin will become the world supreme court and it will come as a snare on everyone who is not aware watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be wor accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And when did I tell you was the night of watching? The night of watching for the redemption, for God to come down and give salvation to his people, is Passover night. The night that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he told the disciples, couldn't you just watch one hour? And he said it three times. He kept coming back, and they kept falling asleep. And he said, sleep on now, because he knew they were going to die, and this was going to be 2,000 years later in the future. So, if you're not watching, and listen, the second Passover that's biblical it's one night, and it lands on May 5th this year, the evening before this King Charles III's coronation on that throne, with a lunar blood moon eclipse. So this should give you the chills altogether, realizing that the fig tree and all the trees and this generation that shall not pass away is when they are putting a king upon the throne, according to Judges 9. Let me just read that verse again for you to reiterate Judges 9, verse 8. One day the trees set out to anoint a king for themselves. The trees set out to anoint a king for themselves. So when you see all these things come to pass, 
the fig tree and all the trees, you know that they are setting out to anoint a king for themselves. Can you believe this revelation that the Lord just opened my eyes to see it? And this is getting ready to happen. And there happens to be a second Passover, another night of watching for the Lord to come down and bring salvation. And what is salvation but the word Yeshua? They're waiting for the Lord to come down, Yeshua, to give a salvation and redemption. Now remember, the British Royal Navy, their ships were always made out of the Royal English oak tree. Some of those oak trees are like 36 feet in diameter. They're huge. And the battleships that they used, you know, they have some of them that are preserved from the 1700s, and they are solid oak. And they are considered um, a source of strength. They represent strength, the Royal English Oak Tree. Now, the wind-blown Royal English Oak that they made the pillars for the anointing screen out of were from the Windsor grounds and from the 1700s. So I wanted to read a couple of things before I get back into when I told you about in another video. I did an entire video that's really thorough about the king of trees in Britain, the royal English oak tree. And this is what King Charles will have at his coronation. But let's just see some of the things about the oak in the Bible. And I'm going to read Genesis 35, verse 8. Now, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak outside Bethel. Ezekiel 27, verse 3. And say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, which art a merchant of the people for many isles, thus says the Lord God, O Tyrus, Thou hast said, I am of perfect beauty. Thy borders are in the midst of the seas. Thy builders have perfected thy beauty. They have made all thy shipboards of fir trees of sneer, and they have taken cedars from Lebanon to make masts for thee. Of the oaks of Bashan have they made thine oars, the company of the Asherites have made thy benches of ivory, brought out of the isles of Ketim. Fine linen embroidered work from Egypt was that which was spreadeth forth to be thy sail. Blue and purple from the isles of Elisha was that which covered thee. The inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad were thy mariners, thy wise men, O Tyrus, that were in thee were thy pilots. The ancients of Gibal and the wise men thereof were in thee thy calkers, and all the ships of the sea with their mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise. Hosea 4.13 They sacrifice on the mountaintops and burn offerings on the hills under oak, poplar and terebinth, where the shade is pleasant. Therefore your daughters turn to prostitution. Okay, so they were doing this in Israel. The Scarlet Harlot, Mystery Babylon the Great. They were sacrificing burnt offerings on the high hills under the oak. Isaiah 2, verse 10, Enter into the rock, and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, 
and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, and the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. See she from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? 1 Kings 13, 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Them they told also to their father, and their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the donkey. So they saddled him the donkey, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread or drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the words of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him, so he went back with him, and did eat bread in his home, and drank water. He was sitting under an oak. So listen to this in Isaiah 1, verse 8. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So the one that's called Sodom in Egypt, where our Lord was crucified, is Jerusalem. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, because she played the scarlet harlot against God. And so they're putting this king, setting him on the throne, once again, at the end of days, before the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. And he said down here, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel... You shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So he brought the sword against the ancient monarchy of Judah in Israel, the deadly wound in the head, and then is going to be healed when they put that last king on the throne. The deadly wound in the head is healed. So it's like a resurrected monarchy. It's not talking about the Antichrist is going to be shot with a gun in the head. A lot of people just go off on these weird tangents. It specifically says it was a sword wound, and God tells you that he brought the sword against the monarchy. He goes on to say, Thy princes are rebellious, 
in companions of thieves, every one loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. And I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges as at first and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward there shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. Okay. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which they have desired. And ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. The strong shall be as tow, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. Ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth. In Genesis 18.1, we see the Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. Isaiah 1.29 says, You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. Now we see in 2 Samuel 18.9, Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule he was riding kept on going. And Absalom was who? He was the king's son. And he died by hanging in a large oak tree. So, remember in the last videos I was telling you about the Royal English Oak Tree being on the anointing screen and the English Oak that's windblown was the poles were carved out of that from, you know, uh, the 1700s and those are the poles with the eagles on them. So King Charles will be anointed and placed on that throne. And then his royal cipher, which I explained from my dream, is the mark of the king, the mark of the beast. A beast is a king. And John the Baptist had said, The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And I showed you how on that coronation anointing screen, the royal cipher is at, is at the base of the trunk of the tree. And all of the nations of the commonwealth are written on the leaves of the tree. So the royal oak tree was considered a sacred tree and they would worship idols and they would sacrifice under every high hill under oak trees. And so this went on with the Celts and the Druids over in Ireland and the British Isles. So now I did that entire video about the two ancient Royal English oak trees that are still standing. One of them caught fire and burned named Gog and the other one is Magog. You know from my video I told you that Gog and Magog are actually the guardians of London. They are over 2,000 year old Royal English oak trees and they are in Glastonbury. that video where I talked about that, which I'll try to put a link to that video because it's very in-depth about the history of Gog Magog. One of them was said to be pushed over a cliff into the sea as a giant. So 
when you see a beast rising out of the sea, you're actually seeing a kingdom, a king, coming out of the sea. And Gog and Magog are said to be involved at the time of the rising of the Antichrist. In various prophetic texts, Gog and Magog participated in the persecutions led by Antichrist. Okay, Gog and Magog are the guardians of London. And who's the king of London and the British Isles? King Charles III? Gog and Magog participated in the persecutions led by Antichrist, preceded Antichrist as a sign of his coming, or emerged following the defeat of Antichrist in the struggle prior to the Last Judgment. So they may be involved more than once at his coming, preceding him, and participating in the persecutions because they are the guardians of London. It will emerge another time at the time of the Last Judgment. Now listen to this. I assume you've heard of the oak tree being referred to as the king of trees. We find this tree in European traditions because it was sacred to some gods, such as Zeus and Jupiter and Thor. Zeus was the abomination of desolation statue that was placed in the temple in Jerusalem. So the oak tree was sacred to some gods, such as Zeus. And this is in King Charles III's coronation ceremony, the royal English oak, the king of trees. And of course, Druids and Galatian tribes gathered in oak forests and sanctuaries, meaning that the tree represents community and religious integrity. The Celts saw the tree as a symbol of safety, truth, and bravery. No matter how hard times are, humans can conquer anything and should be kind even towards their enemies. Early literature gives more evidence of the importance of the oak to pagan Celts. A great oak was one of the five sacred trees brought to Ireland by the strange being called Trafunig Tre Ochar, who appeared suddenly at Terra on the day Christ was crucified. An emissary from the other world, he bore a branch on which were acorns, apples, nuts, and berries, which he shook onto the ground. These wondrous fruits were planted into five different parts of Ireland, and from them grew five great trees that oversaw each province until they were blown down by the disapproving winds of the church in the 7th century. Among these was the great oak of Mugna, which stood in southern Kildare. This bile, or sacred tree, was celebrated in Edinburgh. In England, the oak is a national symbol of strength. Couples were wed under ancient oaks in Oliver Cromwell's time. Oak is the emblem of many environmental groups, including the Woodland Trust, part of the Green Agenda. I wanted to say about Gog and Magog, and they appear in the Bible and the Quran as individuals, tribes, or lands. In Ezekiel 38, Gog is an individual and Magog is his land. So I would say Gog is a king and Magog is his land. So there you have in the city of London, within London, the effigies of Gog and Magog, the statues in the Royal Guild Hall. That's where it was said that the real Gog and Magog, they were giants, that they were brought to that spot in ancient times, and all of these events happened, which I read to you in my video on the Royal English Oak Tree and how Gog and Magog are these two trees named Gog and Magog in Glastonbury, England. 
So it would be an individual and the land that he's ruling. So doesn't it make sense that King Charles III comes with Gog and Magog? He's got the royal English oak tree, the king of trees, in his coronation ceremony. In Genesis 10, that's where it's listed. Magog is a man and ancestor of a nation, but no Gog is mentioned. By the time of Revelation 28, Jewish tradition had long since changed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog. So it's sounding like it was a king from Magog the land that he ruled. It says the Gog prophecy is meant to be fulfilled at the approach of what is called the end of days, but not necessarily the end of the world. Jewish eschatology viewed Gog from the land of Magog as enemies to be defeated by the Messiah, which would usher in the age of the Messiah. That goes right along with him sitting on the throne of David and Jesus comes down as the king of kings and he takes the kingdoms of this world. King Charles III will be sitting on that throne of David as their anointed one and he will remove this. This is connected to Gog and Magog as the enemies defeated by the Messiah to usher in the age of the Messiah. One view within Christianity is even more starkly apocalyptic, making Gog and Magog here indicating nations rather than individuals, allies of Satan against God at the end of the millennium as described in the book of Revelation. A legend was attached to Gog and Magog by the time of the Roman period that the gates of Alexander were erected by Alexander the Great to repel the tribe. Romanized Jewish historian Josephus knew them as the nation descended from Magog, the Japhite, as in Genesis, and explained them to be the Scythians. In the hands of the early Christian writers, they became apocalyptic hordes. So throughout the Middle Ages, they were variously identified with the Vikings, Huns, Khazars, Mongols, Turanians, or other nomads, or even the ten lost tribes of Israel. You know, there's the ten that receive power as kings for one hour with the king, with the beast. And Israel sees their Messiah as restoring all the tribes, like an ingathering. So could those ten be a chieftain over each one of the ten tribes that become kings for one hour with the beast, the king that's in charge, to do whatever it is they're going to do. So that is really interesting that Jewish tradition had long since changed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog. So I see that as a king and his land that he comes from. Where are they? They are in Glastonbury, England, and they are in the city of London, within London, the effigies, the statues of Gog and Magog. And here, King Charles III's poles for his anointing screen, that's three-sided um, trilateral, like the trilateral commission plot, to be the world currency for trade. I think is interesting is that I had read that it was the city of London that had dedicated this for the coronation. The city of London is where Gog and Magog statues are. So it was a gift from them. He's got these windblown royal English oak poles on that three-sided trilateral anointing screen that he will be completely hidden behind when they do the sacred ceremony.
Of all the trees in Britain and Ireland, the oak is considered king. Famed for its endurance and longevity, even today it is synonymous with strength and steadfastness in the popular mind. John Evelyn, in his Silva, or a Discourse of Forest Trees, calls it the pride and glory of the forest, and in the fairy faith in Celtic countries, Evans Wentz proclaims that the oak is preeminently the holy tree of Europe. This is that royal English oak tree that has fallen in 1991 that Queen Elizabeth I picnicked under and King Charles II hid inside this tree. In the classical world, it was regarded as the tree of life as its deep roots penetrate as deep into the underworld as its branches soar to the sky and it was held sacred to Zeus and Jupiter, the abomination of desolation. Its name derives from the Anglo-Saxon word ac, A-C. That's interesting, Antichrist, A-C. But in Irish, the word is dour, and in Welsh, dar, and were. Probably cognate with the Greek dress, some scholars consider this the ori origin of the term druid, since druids have always been associated with sacred groves and particularly oak forests. Okay, well, it's the next day, and I have to add one more thing onto this. And I wanted you to know that, you know, there's like all kinds of folk tales and things like this in the Old English folklore. And the Royal English Oak Tree was related to sacrifice. When the official Royal Coronation Invitation came out, you will see at the bottom of the coronation invitation the face of a green man with leaves coming out of his ears. Now, nobody really knew what that was, but I ran into what it was when I was researching about the Royal English Oak Tree and some folk tales that are associated with it. First, let me show you the face of the green man at the bottom of the official royal coronation invitation. This goes back to sacrifice. Another godlike personage bearing the insignia of the oak is described in the Feast of Brickrui where three famous warriors, including Kerkulian, take turns in guarding the dun of Kuroi while he is away. Two of them fail, then during Kerkulian's watch, a gigantic warrior attacks the settlement, who hurls great branches of oak at Kerkulian. After a tremendous battle, Kerkulian defeats him. Later, it becomes apparent that the assailant was Kroy himself, whose other name is McDare, son of Oak Tree. It is clear that this tale is a forerunner of the medieval poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and the symbolic beheading of the Oak King links these tales with the well-known ritual sacrifice of the old king in the oak grove of the Nemi, which forms the argument of Fraser's The Golden Bough. The sacrifice at Nemi took place at summer solstice, 
which brings us to the battle between the Oak King personifying the waxing wear and the Holly King who ruled the waning year. At midsummer, as the year began, its turn towards the dark again, the holly was victorious. But at midwinter, the oak king defeated the forces of darkness once again, revealing himself as a vegetation god who must die each year so that life can be renewed. It is not surprising then that images of the green man carved in wood and stone in medieval churches most frequently show oak leaves growing out of his ears and mouth. So this is what this green man is at the bottom of the king's royal invitation. Now this is all in the tales of the history of the Druids and what they believed. The Oak's connection with sacrifice is again echoed in the Welsh story, Math, son of Mathonwy. The hero Lu is betrayed and killed, but after his death he turns into an eagle and perches atop a magical oak tree. Now those royal oak poles have the eagle on top, on the coronation screen. So, let me say that again. He turns into an eagle and perches atop a magical oak tree on a plain, the place where most sacred trees were situated, where he suffered nine score hardships. Lou's fate reminds us of the famous sacrifice by Odin of himself to himself on the great ash tree. With this new facet of the oak symbolism revealed, it is clear that the oak's reputation as a tree of strength, abundance, and endurance depends on its yearly death and rebirth unless we align ourselves with the great cycle of life and death. There can be no true renewal in springtime. Country people frequented the oak for its curative powers which in some place was considered so great that healing could occur simply by walking around the tree and wishing the ailment to be carried off by the first bird alighting on its branches. So you got the birds on the royal English oak tree on the anointing screen. So there's much more folklore regarding the royal English oak tree but finding out what that face was on the royal invitation for the coronation the green man at the bottom was connected to this ancient folklore. When the seals are being opened in Revelation 6, we see in verse 12, And behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth and the great men, and the rich men, and chief captains, and mighty men, and every bondsman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. It's saying that the king's going to hide himself, which is interesting because King Charles II hid himself in the royal English oak tree. The kingdoms of this world from these kings on the earth and he's going to rule and reign forever. The Lord says in Ezekiel 17:24, All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree, which is what Jesus did to the fig tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. So when you see all these trees declaring, the fig tree and all the trees declaring that the people are setting a king upon the throne for themselves, you know that summer is nigh, and it is, at this coronation. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near.